We need to get started, so uh, Ben Wilson does in fact uh, have a uh, one o'clock uh, pretty rigid um, time frame for us, so we do need to get moving. But uh, Dean Wilson, who is known to uh, all of us, has uh, very kindly uh, agreed to come and talk to us today and share his impressions and his experiences from serving on the presidential transition team uh, in December, um, where he did two things, uh, at least two things. One was to lead the BBG Broadcasting Board of Governors uh, Agency Review Team, and he also served as a formal advisor on public diplomacy at the State Department Review Team, where amongst other things, he interviewed senior public diplomacy officers and he briefed the then secretary-designate. We asked Dean Wilson if he would share his views as well, a little more broadly, on what he saw as the, the limits and the potential of public diplomacy under the new administration as it seeks to recast America's image in the world. Now, CPD, the Centre on Public Diplomacy, is in fact following these events very, very closely, and. Uh, uh, we wanted to just draw your attention to our new website and if you do visit that website there you will find a couple of features that are relevant to the things that we're talking about today. The first is our public diplomacy in the news feature and the second is our media monitor which basically tracks a wide range of policy recommendations for the new administration. So we do welcome you to that new website. Dean Wilson is going to talk for about 20 minutes or so. We're then going to have a, a good Q&A, and I hope a robust Q&A session after that. It will be videotaped, so I give you the heads up on that, and it will be posted in due course on the Centre's website. So, Dean Wilson, we look forward to great anticipation to what you have to say, and welcome. Thank you very much. I want to thank Jeff. Um, and his wonderful staff at the center for putting this event together. Uh, I've really been looking forward to it as a chance to kind of organize my own thoughts a bit on this very important subject. Um, however, since I've been back, which is all of six hours now, uh, when I've been stopped in the hall, people have said, well, what was the inauguration like? <laughs> so let me just get that out of the way first. <laughs> Um, so as, because uh, I guess that's sort of uh, equally important because the transition led to the inauguration. Uh, a couple things. One is that because through the generosity of, of several people on our advisory boards, uh, my wife and I were given tickets right at the foot of the Capitol. And so we had great seats sort of on the 50 yard line straight out from the platform from where the uh, president elect. Uh, was transformed into the President of the United States. Uh, and it was really quite remarkable. Um, to me, it felt like a combination of a political rally, a religious revival, and a family picnic. Especially those families that like to picnic when it's 20 degrees outside. <laughs> um, but it, there were, the statistic that I found remarkable, but I believe because I saw it with my own eyes, is there were somewhere between 1.5 and 2 million people in attendance, and there were no arrests during the day. That's why I said it, it, it really, you know, everyone in the crowd had a sense that something important was going on. And that's why I said it was like a religious revival, a family picnic and a political rally. Uh, my wife and I did not stay down in one of those hotels that cost $5,000 a night, and you had to buy five nights in advance, and so, so we stayed out, for those of you who know the Washington area, we stayed out Silver Spring, Maryland, up in that direction, near Walter Reed Hospital, actually, in the district. Um, we were out at the Huffington Post party until <coughs> about three, 2 a.m. So we got to bed about 3 a.m. Um, and then we got up at 6 a.m. to get down to the mall the following day. And so we were driven by a very dear friend whose house, we, whose floor we were sleeping on, um, to go to the Silver Spring Metro stop. We got there about 7.30 in the morning. It was packed, as you might imagine. Silver Spring, Tacoma Park, for those of you Washington type. By the time we got to Tacoma Park, there was no more room on the, sub on the eight-car subway train. Maybe two or three people could get off, 
three or four people would get on. That was true all the way down to Metro Center. Metro Center was so crowded that when you got off the subway train, you were directed toward the far end of the platform, you know, half a football length down this way, to loop back around and go up the steps or to get to your transfer point. And I say that because, you know, these are, you know, hun hundreds of thousands of people underground in a subway, tr you know, trying not to be late, trying not to be cold. No one broke in line. No one pushed and shoved. No one cursed and sputtered. It really was a sense of, um, of unity and togetherness that uh, had occurred to me only one time earlier in my life. I was lucky enough to be at the March on Washington in 1963 on August 28th. And it was striking because that occurred at the other end of the mall. That was at the, Wash at the Lincoln Memorial. And I remember standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial behind Dr. King when he was giving his remarks. And you could look up the mall toward the, uh, the Lincoln, uh, toward the uh, Washington Monument, the White House, 250,000 people there. That was a lot. On Tuesday of this week, I stood at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, turned around and looked back toward the Lincoln Memorial. And as far as the eye could see, there were Americans. And I might add, a large number of Europeans, Africans, and others who had flown in uniquely for this event. And there are a lot of non-Americans who flew in who felt that they wanted to participate in this event. And as you probably saw on television, there were moments when all those flags would ra wave. And it just, it, it was a very, very emotional uh, moment. I think it was an emotional moment for everyone, for all Americans. Uh, it was a relatively nonpartisan crowd. There are relatively few boos when the outgoing president was referred to. And I do have to say uh, it was striking for those of us in the audience who were African Americans who had been raised around American flags and who were very proud of being Americans, but for whom flags were not the first part of our decoration in our homes growing up. In part, it's to be very um, uh, personal about this, is that the American flag was not always born with goodwill as far as people of color African Americans were concerned in the United States of America. It was often associated with the more conservative elements who were not for integration, who were not for equal opportunity. And uh, one of the wonderful sights was to see people, my, even as old as I, uh, and people who were teenagers and kids, African Americans, Hispanics, Caucasians, all carrying American flags. And it's the first time in my 60 years that I had seen something like that happen. So it was very moving, I think, for, for all of us. We all stood in the cold for hours and hours and hours. Um, at the end of that, and then I'm going to turn to uh, the uh, transition part, uh, through the good graces of the university, I was able to go to the uh, Los Angeles, uh, Washington office. You know, all the major cities have, have offices in Washington to lobby and so forth. And uh, Jen Grodsky was there and was, you know, sort of arranged. And the mayor came in as well and spent a lot of time. Uh, the mayor of Los Angeles was there. We were right next to the uh, a city called Chicago. So the two offices were right there and we were back and forth. So it was a very exciting time, um, a wonderful time. And in the speech and leading up to that day, of course, the then president-elect talked a lot about diplomacy. And what he said in his campaign speeches is that he wanted to restore America's position of trust and respect in the world. And he said that at a, in, at a famous speech he gave in Washington, I think it was at Georgetown or George Washington, where he said, we have to return to diplomacy. Well, that's very easy to say, but it's tough to do. So part of what I'm going to talk about now is how you move from blah, blah, blah in a campaign to actually doing something about that. 
And for that, I would simply like to um, remind us the purpose of a presidential transition. You know, we have this weird system, unlike the um, uh, other Anglo-Saxon system, where you have an election and people take over the next day, and they've been backbenchers, and so they know what they're going to do. Um, that doesn't happen in the United States of America. In the United States of America, there are 3,000 people who leave their positions on the 20th of, uh, of January, and 3,000 new people have to go in and take their positions because we have a lot of political appointees. And so the purpose of a, of a political transition then uh, is several fold. Once, remember that the election takes place in November and the government doesn't come in until January. And so the purpose is several fold. One is to select and stand up a new team of people who will occupy the most senior positions of the administration. Secondly is to think about, well, what policies will we pursue whether it's Ronald Reagan saying this or George W. Bush saying this is what all presidential transitions do. What policy shall we, shall we pursue? Um, thirdly, they think about, well, what instruments do we have available to us to implement these policies? And do they need to be improved? And by that I mean the federal agencies, the uh, departments, et cetera. And then also it's usually spent uh, recovering from 24 months on the campaign where you're sprinting every day, especially in the modern period. And so that's what November to January is supposed to be about. But um, what I just want to mention, I'm going to come back to that in a moment, is this was an unconventional transition. It's an unconventional transition. In national security terms, the United States of America was fighting two wars, con two conventional wars, one in Afghanistan and one in Iraq. That's not usually happening during the midst of a, uh, during a presidential transition. It was also fighting an unconventional war, the war against terror, which could lead to an attack at any moment. The United States economy was an economic freefall, and no one knew what, where the bottom was going to be. And this is happening during the period of transition between November and January. There was also a generational transition going on that was, v and not to be underestimated, very, very important. One of the shocking things about uh, going through the halls of the, of the uh, transition headquarters was looking around at all these, now that I'm the age I am, said, who, are, who are all these young people in here? <laughs> Let's get some people with experience, but there, it, it was really a generational transition, and you could see that, and you've seen it already in many of the appointments. And then finally, we are in an unconventional period because United States global standing and impact was deteriorating before our very eyes, whether it's the Russians doing what the Russians were doing, whether it was what was going on in the Middle East right before the, uh, the elections and into the transition. So you had these pressures that were very, very unusual and did not permit the usual kind of transition. And I want to say something about that because that was communicated to those of us who were on the transition team. And um, I want to convey that in a moment. I'm going to end up by saying, uh, speaking mostly about public diplomacy, of course, uh, in the short three and a half minutes that I have remaining. Um, but Jeff got it mostly right. Um, I was sort of asked to do four things. Well, let, let, me, let me back up a bit. The way the transitions are organized, um, the incoming administration rents an office building. It's really unbelievable. But they rent a bloody office building, and they rent furniture, desks, and buy pencils to plan the transition in the most powerful country in the world. Um, and so you've got a, a building which is on 6th Street, 6th and E roughly in Washington, and you've got little cubicles, so the future secretary of whatever is sitting next to the future chief of staff who's sitting next to, you know, all in these little <laughs> cubicles. It sort of feels like a frat house. <laughs> you know, it's like a college dorm because everybody's working too hard and they're not sleeping and they're all running from room to room 
uh, going from high seriousness to giggling because you know that these are the first three seconds of the universe and it's going to blow up and expand outward and these people who are in these little cubicles will be running the Pentagon, running the State Department, et cetera, et cetera, running the White House. Um, the office in turn is divided into three parts. One part is presidential personnel, which is very important. I worked on presidential personnel in 92 for the Clinton transition, which was very different from the current transition in a variety of ways that we can go into in the question and answer period that have to do with organization. Uh, if, the, if, if it always feels like a frat house, it really felt like a frat house <laughs> in a college dorm in 92. So there's one group of people who do presidential personnel. And what's remarkable about this group is that m months before the election, there was a group of people who were selected to start doing a vetting of possible appointees to the administration. 200 people were vetted, not by the FBI, which comes later, but by the advisors to candidate Barack Obama. So they have their own wing and there's, you know, there's presidential personnel for national security and international affairs, there's presidential personnel for health, et cetera, et cetera, kind of the functional cones that are divided that way. Then secondly, uh, there are agency review teams. There's an agency review team for the Defense Department, for the State Department, for HHS, for the Peace Corps, et cetera, et cetera. Each one of those, each one of those has a team leader. Um, I was asked to be the team leader for the group that was reviewing international broadcasting, which is the Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Radio Marti, um, the, the Al Hura, for example. Some of you may have heard of Al Hura. Uh, our center did a, um, a report that uh, drew a lot of attention to Washington, D.C., that the center did. Uh, and I was questioned on it deeply and many times and defended it with all my uh, heart and soul. Mm -hmm. More about that later. Uh, so there are these agency review teams. Thirdly, there are policy teams. Because you're on the campaign trail, you go blah, blah, blah about, uh, about diplomacy and we're going to do this on defense and this on health care. Well, at some point you've got to go from relatively general ideas down to something that could be actionable because one of the first things that happens with a new administration is you have to prepare a budget for February, for the February period. So you have got to hone this down. So I was asked to, uh, it was really much too much, but it was fun. Um, I was asked to run the agency review team for international broadcasting. Um, and I was based there for it at uh, Voice of America down on C Street, interviewed a ton of folks. I was also asked to be the advisor on public diplomacy for the State Department team, which meant that I went to the State Department on a fairly regular basis to meet with and interview all the folks who are responsible for public diplomacy at the State Department. Thirdly, uh, in some ways, the, the, the especially fun was that I was working, because I've done a fair amount of work on innovation issues, as some of you know. And because of the oddness of the transition, the president-elect knew that he had to come up with an economic stimulus program to try to get the country out of economic freefall. And just you know, think back three weeks, you know, three or four weeks ago, when no one knew if this economy was going to turn into a complete meltdown, or whether it was going to bottom out, high uncertainty. There was a faction, of course, that said, let's spend money on infrastructure, roads, highways, et cetera, which is the quickest way to generate additional monies. A dollar spent on, a, on, a, on that kind of work will generate a dollar sixty or so uh, for the economy as a whole. Whereas tax cuts, it turns out, tend to generate about 85 cents because people save, et cetera, et cetera, if one might expect. So there was a small group that was put together to say, okay, we want to spend money on roads and bridges, but what about innovative infrastructure? Um, how can we build into the conversation notions of broadband, 
biotechnology, uh, green technology, uh, information technology, social media, the kinds of things that don't always, aren't always thought about as infrastructure. And I have to say, as a you know, policy wonk and a geek, like I guess many of us in the room, uh, that was really fun because that was uncharted territory. Um, the conversation, and there was a group of half do dozen or so folks from around the country who were consulted by telephone on a regular basis. How can we get this message into the president-elect? He wants to do something in this area. He doesn't want the stimulus package to be conventional. Um, and so one did have the illusion that one's ideas were being carried forward. The sort of standing joke for people who've done this before, as I have, uh, both working on the campaign and in other contexts, is we pretend to advise and they pretend to listen. <laughs> so it's very easy to get all puffed up while I was advising President Obama, and uh, I said, you know, Barack, you've really got blah, blah. It doesn't happen that way, you know. We advise people who advise other people who advise him, and he may or may not pay attention or even see the memo. So um, it's, it's useful to keep one's ego in check in these things because we propose and they dispose. Um, and then the final piece, I was working on a, 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 uh, advising a little group called the NTIA, National Telecommunications Information Agency, which is under the Commerce Department, which <coughs> under Clinton was actually rather important because it was the one where a lot of the discussions on, um, on the digital divide really grew out of that in the work of Larry Irving, who's still a member of our board of counselors um, here. There are a lot of U.S. I was delighted. There are a lot of USC alums, people who came up and said, you know, fight on. <laughs> you know, we would pass each other in the hall and do the, you know, this thing and uh, hope that nobody from UCLA saw us do this. But, uh, so that was pretty cool. Uh, and because we have a powerful congressional delegation, Nancy Pelosi is very interested in innovation, as you might imagine. Waxman had just won his battle to uh, become chairman of that important committee. So innovation was in the air. Very important. What I want to do in, in, in is just to highlight a couple of, of things. I'm not going to say much about the BBG. I know there's some people in the room who are very interested in broadcasting. I'd be happy to talk about those issues. But I think it was the consensus of the discussion, with one exception, that took place in Washington that the BBG is not a hugely broken organization. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Board of Broadcasting Governors is the umbrella that oversees the other radio stations and TV stations like Voice of America, Radio Marti, and a TV Marti that broadcast allegedly into Cuba, um, Radio Free Asia, etc. They get just about half of the public diplomacy budget. But what's interesting is the Secretary of State has absolutely no control over 50% of her budget. Because it's not really her budget for reasons we can go into because, um, as Jeff Cowan knows very well, um, a firewall was built between the State Department and the International Broadcast Services so that the international broadcast services would not simply be the propaganda arm of whatever administration was in control of the White House, whether Democrat or Republican. So it's kept at an arm's length. And it's a very odd organization. Um, it's mostly successful as, at what it does, with one big exception. The exception, the most contentious one, is what is happening with our Middle East broadcast. Radio Free Asia less co controversial, VOA, some controversy over its effectiveness, but the real point of contention, the sharp end of the spear, is um, what we do in the Middle East. And we can come back to that in question and answer. Um, on the uh, innovation and stimulation, stimulus package, you saw what happened. The president-elect began to speak more and more about broadband, about green technology, et cetera, et cetera, which I think points to his real commitment to this. Um, now let me say something about public diplomacy. Uh, some of this, I cannot go into all sorts of detail because that was still 
kind of confidential, but we did have a meeting on the 19th of December where we drew together about 15 of, um, of the leaders of public diplomacy. It was my thought that wouldn't it be weird to do something on public diplomacy and not consult with the public mm -hmm. on public diplomacy, but only talk to the bureaucrats and government officials who are responsible mm -hmm. for it. So we invited uh, a number of people uh, from um, Business for Democratic Action, BD, BDA, from the Institute for International Education, from the Public Diplomacy Association, uh, George Washington University, our sister program there that also does good, good work in public diplomacy. So about 15 of us met at the um, transition headquarters. Once we could get through the metal detectors, the pat down, and so I thought, gee, this is just like going to an American embassy abroad. So we felt somewhat comfortable about that. Uh, and some very interesting things came up. Um, and I'm just going to toss out three conclusions and then a fourth big problem. Number one, get organized. Number two, get out of Washington. And number three, get digital. Get organized, get out of Washington, and get digital. Now, the broad framing of this, I want to say, is something like the following three points. One is that the incoming administration has a very different attitude toward national security policy and diplomatic policy than the outgoing administration. Um, national security memo uh, that was prepared by the outgoing administration basically said, we feel comfortable acting unilaterally anytime we wish, that we will rely largely on a militarily defined definition of diplomacy. Very different strategy. What the Obama administration seems to be saying is we want to listen, we want to learn, and we think diplomacy is important. Secondly, the substance of the policies pursued by the previous administration, I'm trying to maybe take this button off and put on my scholarly cap, but I think I'm not saying things that are partisan but are part of what you read about in Foreign Affairs magazine or Foreign Policy magazine, not to mention you know, Stern or Le Monde or other uh, international publications. So <clears throat> Barack Obama and his appointees face a problem. What the world considers to be bad substantive policy, Kyoto, human rights, et cetera, in many areas. I'm overstating it, but I've only got negative two minutes to go. Um, secondly, the approach is unilateralist and not consultative. And thirdly, the instruments for public diplomacy have been regularly starved, stripped, and badly led for six or seven years. At the end of the Clinton administration, one agency, USIA, which is where all the public diplomats were, was merged into the hated State Department, from their point of view, which were the traditional diplomats. So this was a merger and an acquisition that was not easily done at first. So that was a tough culture blend. Secondly, there were four or five undersecretaries of state for public diplomacy. Karen Hughes, Pat Harrison, Pat Harrison again, Jim Glassman is the current person, and the first person from <coughs> right, Charlotte Beers, who came from uh, Right. So there were a bunch of, you can't lead effectively an organization if you have six or seven CEOs in a row in that many years. So the poor public diplomacy initiative, stagnant money, no leadership, a merger and an acquisition that led both sides demoralized, and the President of the United States said, we're not going to, no matter what you do, we're not going to pay attention to what you say anyway on the State Department side. So the new administration then has to face those conditions. Get organized. That means within the State Department, which has most responsibility for public diplomacy, there's something called the R Bureau. I don't know what R stands for. Maybe somebody, I can think of some words I won't say in public, but um, it's a relatively small bureau. It's the newest bureau. The 
the poor uh, undersecretary has $20 million walking around money, which is chump change. Uh, so that position is limited. Secondly, what's the role? So that internally things have to get organized. We can come back and talk about that. Externally, this, the previous administration has largely relied on the military to do a lot of the diplomatic work. We had a wonderful conference that you organized, and along with Nick Cole and others, on AFRICOM, which was the role of the military in public diplomacy. Um, point of comparison, there are more lawyers in the Defense Department than there are diplomats in the State Department. The military marching bands have more members than does the entire State Department. So there's some budgetary leadership issues that must be addressed, including what is the role in the White House. For interagency work, because it's not just the State Department but that, that does this work, commerce, USTR, U, um, USAID, they will not listen to the State Department alone if the State Department says do this or that in public diplomacy. Only the National Security Council, the White House, can do that. Some of you, I think, were in this room last week when one of the representatives of the National Security Council came out to chat with us about what our views were and how we might organize this. So they've got to get organized. Secondly, get the hell out of Washington. The great strength of the United States of America, as Alexis de Tocqueville said, was what? Did he say, you know, the great strength of, of America are the diplomats who work in the R Bureau? That's not what he said. Nor did he say it was the great station managers who run BBG. He said the great strength of the United States of America is its civil society. We do that better than anybody in the world. We love to do it. We have associations. There's an association in Washington for associations. <laughs> that should be the focus of the work we do. And we should use the government to facilitate this kind of work. Um, thirdly, get digital. And by that I mean not simply use, you know, cell phones and uh, the internet. And this is probably the toughest problem, which is that, as we all know, it's including people who are sitting around this, this very table and, and uh, in this room, to use effectively the instruments that are now technologically available to us, one has to largely reinvent the incentive structure of the organizations and institutions that would use these tools. Remember the, the, the statement by a uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics, uh, Robert Solow, who said uh, not too long ago that the uh, computerization and the information revolution is having a great impact everywhere except in the productivity figures in the private sector. Because companies would just take the computers and drop them into their old organizational structure. And guess what? It didn't work. No productivity increases for a decade. The only way it works, as many of you know, is you flatten the hierarchy. You let the people at the bottom speak. And in the school of communication, we know what the digital revolution means. It means uh, uh, interactivity. It means user-generated content. It means online communities. It means mobilizing networks, social networks, which are empowered and enabled by the technology but are not a substitute for it. The problem, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, is that to have an effective public diplomacy, someone in Washington is going to have to re-acculturate the State Department, the relationships between the State Department and the White House, and the way that the American government approaches <coughs> its conversations. Because I do think this, this administration wants to have conversations. They, they want to listen. They want to have a two-way conversation. We have the tools available to do that. The problem is, is that all institutions have to change the incentive structure and the reward structure to be truly digital. This is a struggle we're having here at the Annenberg School for Communication. We are desperately trying to sprint 
here at the Annenberg School for Communication, into the 21st century by changing the way we teach and how we teach and the tools that we have available. Are we going to be, as they say, a sage on the stage or a guide on the side? I like the sage part myself, but, you know, but we can't do that. We've got to change the way we teach. And the State Department has to do that too. It can't be the ambassador up here on a pedestal and folks who are blogging who are located someplace else. Can't do it, won't work. Nobody under 24 will pay attention to this anymore. So I think the new administration uh, get organized, including appointing a new uh, undersecretary for um, public diplomacy, get more money, coordinate better inside the government, maybe create an institution outside of government, which has been proposed uh, by a congressionally mandated study to set up a kind of semi-independent organization. So, Get organized, get out of Washington and rely on civil society and not just hard-working diplomats. And they, you know, God bless them. The folks that I interviewed are doing the Lord's work inside the belly of the beast. You know, they're all in tough bureaucracies. The folks who are really committed to this are really committed to it and really trying to work to change the culture inside state and defense and for that matter, the intelligence agencies and the USTR and Peace Corps, et cetera. Get out of Washington and get digital. So let me stop there um, and say that um, I originally went thinking this was going to be, working on the transition was going to be fun. Uh, Jeff Callen hooked me up with an A-list party that I went to <laughs> the first night I was there at the Phillips Gallery. That was really fun. <laughs> because all the Obama people were there with all the Washington people, and they were all sniffing around each other trying to, that was fun. Good food, good drink. After that, it was all downhill. <laughs> and uh, I stayed at my son's apartment, which tells you, and he's 23, so for any of you who know 23-year-old males, you know what their apartments look like. <laughs> Just don't look in the don't, don't look any place. <laughs> There's nothing in the refrigerator. It's all that other part of the apartment that we're, so I'd get up every morning, take the 79 bus down Georgia Avenue, get off, go to work, stay there till 10 o'clock, take the bus back home. Uh, so it wasn't fun, but one, at least I felt like I was making a contribution uh, to something uh, I believed in for substantive topics that I thought were important. Uh, I pretended hard to advise, and I hope that uh, the folks I were, was working with uh, did listen a bit. But it is a, an opportunity to, to uh, participate. And I would urge, especially the young people in the room, in four years, get involved in a political campaign. Work for the Republicans, work for the Democrats, work for independents, work for somebody in the campaign. Because there are people of student age who were at the PTT, Presidential Transition Team Headquarters. And it's a wonderful opportunity for our students, graduate students, undergraduate students to have an opportunity to be sort of present at the, at the creation. So let me open it up to questions now. Thank you very much. Um, I think what I'd like to do is um, uh, just uh, barely 20 minutes. So if you could identify yourself and your affiliation, that would be extremely helpful. And uh, what I'll do is take three questions. Uh, one, for pragmatic reasons, <coughs> to allow a little bit of fight to take place, but also it'll allow more people to participate. So Nick, if you could go first. Well, could you talk about Alvera? Because you know, Phil led this study of Alvera, I participated in it with Sean. And what we found in the Middle East were people looking on Alvera as doing to the news what the CIA does to uh, um, sus suspects. And, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> as in, and for the people that we talked to, ending Alvera would be as important as closing down Guantanamo Bay as a sort of a, a gesture of good faith. So how, how, what, what, do you, what are you seeing? So you don't what, what are they going to do? <laughs> so I think that's a great provocative question to start off with. Jonathan. Um, it would seem to me that the biggest issue that the new administration is going to have to face is that 56% of the discretionary budget goes to the Defense Department and about 6% goes to the State Department. Do you see any chance that there will be a redress in those figures? And Mike, you uh, just introduce yourself. If you yeah, I'm Mike Hobbs. I'm a uh, public diplomacy. Uh, 
Um, throughout my brief study of public diplomacy, it seems that uh, public diplomats have to repeatedly defend their already meager budgets, um, like specifically like Jesse Helms after the Cold War. Um, did the transition team look into creating programs that could provide sustainable finance um, that is less dependent on Congress? And uh, when I asked that question, I kind of take in mind uh, the British Council and their paid educational services. Do you have to take those three? Yes. Um, the, let me answer the easier one, which is the budget question. It is hard to be imaginative and embrace the future if you are hunkered down in an institution that is getting whacked with a newspaper every day. If you are doubling up your staff. And so we see that in the public diplomacy area, you know, they've cut through the, the fat the skin, they're now cutting muscle and bone. So it is a very, very serious issue. Um, I think speaking to that, uh, not Secretary Designate, but as of this morning, I think, Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton, did something very interesting. She appointed Jim Steinberg, who is a, uh, a, a real foreign policy maven, LBJ Dean School, and has held every position imaginable in government, just about, is going to be her policy uh, deputy. She's created or activated a new policy person who is going to be strictly budget and management. And that person's job, he comes from the Hill, so that's a great um, origin, is to spend time talking to the authorizing and appropriating committees on the Hill to try to shift some of those resources. But the best news is what? The best news is that Secretary of Defense Gates has said something publicly that all of us, at least many of us, have heard privately. When you talk to folks in the military, the higher up they are, they say, we really like diplomacy. We like diplomacy because if you guys get it right, it's good. If you guys don't get it right, my guys get shot and killed. I mean, they like that. They like the idea of diplomacy. Unfortunately, while they will say this after the conference is over and in the hallways and one-on-one -on -one meetings and small groups, they have not said that publicly. Secretary Gates has said that to advance the national security interests of the United States of America, more money has to be allocated to the State Department. He even said, I would help to lobby to make that happen. Now, no one can say, or I don't think he said this, and I think it would be impossible for him to say, and therefore, <laughs> Here's a 20. Right. Um, but within the constraints of real politique in Washington, D.C., that's about as far as you can go. And I think that uh, um, we will see a buildup in the State Department budget, the 150 account budget. Um, it won't be anywhere near as big as the Defense Department budget, especially under the current, current circumstances. But I would be surprised if that balance weren't redressed a little bit. But that's ultimately a political question. There are more reports and great books on public diplomacy. You know, we could build a house. We could build a mansion with the books and the studies and reports. We've all contributed them. It's only going to happen if it's, politically, if it's a politically astute campaign to shift the financial resources. The Al Hora report. Um, in the meeting that I hosted at the Presidential Transition Headquarters. Uh, we went around the table. I asked the 15 or so people there to say, th what, what, what are the three top things the administration should do, the incoming administration should do in public diplomacy? The only institution that got consistent criticism was not the Central Intelligence Agency. It was not the Department of Defense. It was Al Hura. Al Hura is the television station that broadcasts on behalf of the U.S. government into the Middle East. Um, there is a long, complicated institutional history where instead of that money being uh, allocated to the existing Voice of America and uh, current agency, it was put under a special kind of organization. Um, there have been other reports in addition to the report that our colleagues here worked on. And, the, the, and I, I talked to the authors of some of those reports, including Shibli Talhami, who's one of the leading Middle East experts in the United States of America, not just on broadcast, but on everything. He has a very low opinion of Al Hura. 
there have been other studies uh, fo using focus groups, but they each look at a slightly different slice. Um, you guys looked at sort of the content of what was said on Alhura. Others look at the reach of Alhura. Uh, of the top 20 broadcasting entities, what, you know, what's the ranking from one to two, from one to 20? And as you can imagine, Al Jazeera is right up there at the top. The BBG, I don't know if I brought, has a very interesting planning document, which is sufficiently good that the author of it um, has become somewhat, uh, has become well known around Washington for putting together a strategic plan that does something very odd. It starts off with the origins of the mission, strategic guidance, challenges, implementation strategies, and how to measure these things. You know, God forbid anybody should have a, you know, this organized. Very well done. They have their own um, measures of the effectiveness. I am insufficiently sophisticated to know who is right and who is wrong in this. I want to state that very clearly. But it is striking to me that of the handful of people that study this in an organized, regular way, they reach consistent conclusions which is that the amount of money that's going into Al Hura is not being well spent because of both audience reach and the content of the message. Now, the BBG people, on the other hand, say, well, of course we're not going to get the, uh, the, the listenership or the viewership of, uh, of Al Jazeera. We're, that's not going to happen. Um, and they say we are happy to have and they, they give a figure, 20 million, 30 million listeners who at some point or another turn on their TV set and watch some part for some amount of time of these programs. Now, of course, there are debates, well, how often, you know, how long do they watch it for? Is this a random error as they're switching between, you know, Dallas and, and Al Jazeera? Um, but I do have to say the people who are Working in BBG impressed me with their seriousness and their effort to really try to make this work. I was put in a somewhat awkward position uh, just because I was the dean of the school that did this really critical report. Um, and I will say now, and as I said then, I did not work on the report. I did not vet the report. I reviewed the report with my colleagues when we were there. Um, but I was treated, as were all of the transition people, very respectfully. And these issues were debated, um, I think, in a principled way, rather than saying, well, we don't trust you because you're an academic. Or uh, you had a Brit and a Democrat who did the study. Of course it's going to be wrong. Uh, there was absolutely none of that. It was uh, principled. Um, my hunch, there are four, or five, four new members have to be appointed to this board. And that's something the president's going to have to do. The chairmanship of the board will be very important. I would be surprised if there weren't some kind of reconsideration of both the structure and as well as the performance of these uh, institutions. Uh, sources of money, no, that was sort of beyond our purview, really. Um, I think the, 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 the pie needs to be increased for public diplomacy. Everyone agrees to that. Um, the president needs to make some kind of strong statement, we hope, in the first 100 days, has been recommended by a number of groups, with very good things to say. But we are in the middle of an economic crisis. You know, I lost 25%, I don't know about anybody else, but 25% of my retirement's gone. Uh, and so anything that goes to anything in the federal government, I want to be aware of it. Uh, and it needs to be well spent. But having said that, uh, there, I think there is an effort to try to get a better control, better cognizance of what goes into the public diplomacy uh, pie, if you will, and to do something to raise that, um, probably the most, the most uh, reformist is to create a new institution, like uh, National Endowment for Democracy or U.S. Institute of Peace, et cetera, to do public diplomacy. And that, I don't know, I don't, politically I don't know where that's going to go, but it's a very interesting idea. In the next round, I have 
three pe two people, Professor Castellos and, and Harry Guitard, if you could go, and there was, uh, let me see, um, okay, um, I don't know you, so if you could go third, perhaps after Professor Castellos. Well, let him go no. first. We don't know. So he's, he's new to us. My name is Brad Burlingame. I'm um, in tourism and uh, run the marketing organization for West Hollywood and the Sunset's West Hollywood Night Clubs. Do you leave your business card, by the way? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Public the world, too. Um, that the industry as a whole nationally is working on strong efforts right now to elevate our image around the world. But I'd love for you uh, to talk about the private sector op opportunities and, and obligations. Uh, there's always going to be challenges related to policy development and certainly budget in this economic crisis. But private sector. They, they have a huge opportunity obligation to uh, elevate U.S. image around the world and uh, our relationships with uh, uh, all of our neighbors. I'd be happy to do that. Why don't I shift the order? Because Karen did that work for the business for the yeah. domain action, and that might be appropriate, and then we'll come to Professor Castell. And to building off of Brad's comments, I uh, wanted to ask you too, just this whole idea of a cultural shift. Because when I worked at the State Department uh, during Charlotte Beers' time, there was a tremendous disdain within the Foreign uh, Service Corps for anyone with communications expertise or background. And I think USC has done an amazing job of really elevating the discipline, um, <coughs> truly. Uh, but I will say that what was so, so frustrating is getting the rest of the State Department um, to really back public diplomacy in your real way. And then when it comes to the private sector, defense more than any other agency has come to our little organization and said, how do we partner with the private sector, so much so that Southern Command, when I met with them most recently, they said, our mission is threefold, security, stability, and enabling prosperity. That third little one was quite interesting to me because it was quite a shift from five years ago when I was um, working with DOD more closely, and, and they said, we want to work with the private sector, not only companies, but also NGOs, especially in countries where our diplomatic presence has contracted life in Colombia or Venezuela. So I'm just curious uh, about your thoughts on this as to how the cultural shift can actually take place and then back to Brad's point, what those opportunities are really for the private sector to engage in a serious way. Because I have to say in the last eight years, we, we've offered counsel, we've been wanting to help, but we're all about the action piece of this thing and where we can actually make the most impact, especially given this extraordinary window of opportunity that's presented. Thank you very much. It's a different topic, so maybe we'll take these two as a private sector question. Excellent question. Very important question. Um, on the how to shift the culture, it's going to be an issue of leadership. The good news, I think, is that uh, Secretary of State Clinton gave us, in fact, gave a speech today that said, you are the front line of our traditional diplomacy and our public diplomacy, when she was speaking to the employees of the State Department today. Um, she understands that the PAO, which stands for Public Affairs Officer, the folks who are on the embassy, on the ground, in very difficult, that's what they call the last three feet of diplomacy. They have to be strengthened. Those folks get it. The folks on the ground who actually have to deal with real people, women's organizations and, you know, uh, tr uh, chambers of commerce, I'm not so much worried about the folks on the ground. It's the folks in Foggy Bottom, well-named neighborhood. The hierarchy is Paul Mill. Real guys do Paul Mill. You know, real guys, real gals do Paul, political military. If you can't make it in Palm Mill, then maybe you can do global, or you could do oceans, or you could work in a region. You can be assistant secretary for this region or that region. The lowest status person, the lowest status group, comes out of the USIA group because they were always seen as second class. I mean, let's just be honest. That's what I said. Why? You know, there were real foreign service officers. And then there were public affairs officers. And that is changing slowly. But remember, we're dealing with an institution which is conservative in all countries. It's not just the State Department, that's U.S. State Department that's conservative. The French State Department is conservative, the Brits, et cetera, et cetera. That's going to require leadership. That means that 
the president has to put the pedal to the metal on this one. It means that the secretary is going to have to say we're going to have to shake up our culture. And it means whoever is appointed in that leadership position for public diplomacy hopefully will be somebody, I say this you know, as a guess and a hope, would come from the private sector, but who is, understands the workings of big bureaucratic organizations and the limits of the private sector model brought wholesale into government. I would take it, I, I think that the private sector does have a role to play in this. Uh, one of the things that I hope would happen is that the new secretary and the secretary for uh, public diplomacy would have an early meeting with all of the stakeholders non-governmental organizations, private sector, for individual firms, but more importantly, trade associations that can kind of speak collectively, uh, universities, uh, schools of communication, especially those on the West Coast, uh, should be frequently consulted, um, and get public diplomacy out of Washington. Uh, I think that, you know, the MPAA out here, the Motion Picture Association, has tried to do public diplomacy work with Republican and Democratic administration. Turns out it's actually, on the media side, it's harder than one might think to find that fit. It's not an automatic fit. We'll give you $30 million, go out and produce a, a, a movie that says nice things about the United States. It's got to be more sophisticated. And I think this gets to the digital piece, that I would love to see the private sector come in and not only talk about the substance of the issues or do things on their own, but to have an ongoing dialogue with the secretary and the undersecretary designate or when that she or he is appointed to say, how do you get to be a nimble, digital, interactive, listening organization? Because the private sector has to do that, or what happens to the private sector if they don't listen to their customers and they go out of business? So I think there are a variety of things that can be done, but I, I would actually urge the private sector to work with this concept that I call the quad. And in fact, there's a very interesting piece that um, has been written, uh, America's Edge in a Networked World by Anne Marie Slaughter. Uh, which makes the point that I have also made. You should also, if you're interested in transitions, uh, G uh, Kurt Campbell and Jim Steinberg have a new book out. Uh, Jim is the Deputy Secretary of State, and Kurt Campbell, I think, is Assistant Secretary of State for Asian Affairs. Private sector needs to work with the nonprofit sector, with the academic sector, put together a kind of coalition, if you will, with the State Department, and bring about public diplomacy 3.0. If, if the private sector tries it on its own, it's going to fail. If the universities try to do this on their own, they will only be partly successful. If the NGOs work together with the State Department, maybe they'll make a little headway. My hunch is that if one put together a grand coalition, let's call it, of all of these organizations, because I know there's the BDA that does good work, there's a variety of other uh, non-governmental organizations that do that. Suppose all three of them came together and reached some conclusions and then took them to the State Department or invited the State Department into some of those discussions. Uh, there is a conversation that's going to take place, uh, Nick, you're going to that, I think, in Florida, which may start in this direction. But I tell you, if this doesn't work, it's your fault. <laughs> and it's your fault and it's my fault and it's our fault that we were simply politically incompetent to make the case that we need to make that this is in the national interest that we have to do this and one of the th there were wonderful statistics that came up at, at our meeting uh, like 30 million first generation Americans in the United States of America from various parts of the world. That's a constituency. 60 million Americans go overseas every year. Do we ever mobilize them? I don't think so. How many Peace Corps returned volunteers are there? How many people who've worked for Pfizer or the entertainment have lived overseas? Are they linked up in any way using uh, new digital technology? I don't think so. And so it's basically, if we don't get this right this time around with this government, following on the previous administration, it's our fault. 
It's not the Defense Department's fault, and it's not Barack Obama's fault. It's our fault for failing to mobilize civil society fully to advance America's interest. Can I jump in there? Because um, oh, Professor Castells is foregoing his yes, question, I'm but we, so we don't make, uh, I don't know you, but you can introduce yourself and ask your question. This will have to be the very last. Oh, my God. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Sonny Fox, and uh, or nice to see. Thank, you. thank you for sharing your intimate experiences and bringing them to the table of being actually being there, and uh, for giving us a window on what the transition is like. A few things, I have been working with the public diplomacy people in Martin from time to time. One of the things I perceive is a, a stubborn adherence to the Voice of America model, which comes out to be Al Bora in this particular mm -hmm. period of time. It seems to me they have to back off from that and understand that there are other ways now of, of, of dealing with populists and, and cultures to get the messages across. I've been just working with them to get extra money from the Congress. They have $3 million now out of which, as of today, comes a new series that will be done in Cairo, TV series of entertainment series. Another one that will, no, that will be coming out, sorry, that's not coming out, but it's another problem there is, there's one coming out of Cairo, and I have just been asked to serve as an advisor on that one for them. These are dramatic series done by the people in those countries, yes. embedded in the storylines of the issues that have to be dealt with in those areas. That, it seems to me, is a very important transition that has to be made in public diplomacy. I wondered if that came up and was addressed as it went along in that transition period. Somewhat, but insufficiently. I mean, I, I think those of us who are fortunate enough to live in Los Angeles have a very different view of the world than those who live in Washington, D.C. And whatever ambition I had to remain in Foggy Bottom this time around, <laughs> spending three weeks, <laughs> enough. Um, and it's just a very, Sonny, it's a very different mindset. And the notion of high production value, capturing eyeballs, capturing ears, and as importantly, it using the new technologies to engage people where they are. I mean, one of the wonderful things that came out of the discussion, and even I kept forgetting about it, but my colleague Woody Demitz, who was uh, on the team with me, tremendous, tremendous guy, worked at VOA, BBG, he said the, mar he said the market proce precedes the message not the other way around. It's a powerful, fundamental issue that I keep forgetting. I, you know, the, the, my evil side you know, keeps forgetting it it's not that way, which is the following. If you want to have a conversation with an individual, or if you want to convince them of something, the most important thing you need to know is not your, what you want to convey, but where their heads are. Where their head, what does the market respond to? What are their daily concerns? And we can't say, well, Africa's different from the Middle East. Yes. Ghana, the, the, the message for Ghana will be different from the message for Ivory Coast, which is right next door. The message for uh, Kuwait is going to be different than the message of Saudi Arabia. Well, how do we find this out? You need people on the ground who speak the language who are out there every day listening to people, interpreting. And it's, you know, this is not a done deal. For, I mean, I have to say, this is not, our ability to reform this is not a done deal, Sonny. And it's, um, it's this new aspect which is so important. Now, what, what one is reminded is that in this country, you know, we talk all about multiple platforms and user-generated content and so forth. 30 million people a week listen to national public radio. Not national public <coughs> online Google stuff. Listen to the bloody radio. You know, if, if you have a site that gets 150,000 hits a week or so, I mean, that's a lot. So radio is still important. Even I was finally convinced against all of my prejudices and all of my knowledge and all of my brains and my PhD that I was wrong, that shortwave radio still has a role to play in Cambodia and in Vietnam and places like that. 
So we need to be smart to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time, which is to do really good content that's relevant to the local areas in Cairo or Damascus, wherever. We need to do interactive stuff. We need to do television. We need to do films. We need to do exchange programs. We need to do all of these things. But my hope is that if we could put a man on the moon 20 years ago or something, whatever, 30, 40, 40, who's counting? 40. <laughs> oh, that man on the moon. Then I would like to think that the State Department and the, and the U.S. government, I'll say, you know, the Obama administration, could figure this out. I'll close by saying one thing. Whether it is true or not, the folks like Julius Janikowski and others who are around Barack Obama, uh, Julius was in law school with, uh, with the current president. Wow, that's freaky. The current president of the United States. Uh, in law school, he was, uh, uh, on the, he was chief of staff for Reed Hunt on, at the FCC. He was an entrepreneur. He really gets this digital stuff to his fingernails. Julius and the people around him honestly believe that they would not have won if it weren't for the internet and user-generated content and cell phones, you know, pushing out the message. They really believe, I and mean, this is not like old people saying, well, okay, I'll, yes, we probably should pay attention to that. They think they would not hold state power today if they had not figured out the new communications revolution and learned how to make it powerful. This gives, that more than anything else gives me hope. You look at what's happening in the State Department and BBG and it's, you know, back and forth and bureaucratic infighting and blah, blah, not enough money. But the, guy, the people who are running the most powerful country on earth, in their heart of hearts, believe that these new media platforms are essential, first of all, to get elected. Secondly, for those of you who still pay attention to these things, I don't think a day's gone by where I haven't gotten some damn message on my cell phone that says, send money for this, uh, Michelle wishes you happy birthday. Um, well, we can be pretty sure, you know what the next messages are going to say? Your Congress, and this is me, this is not, you know, my own personal view. The congressman in your district is not supporting health care, the health care plan that you said that you want and that we said that we would bring you blast out to very active voters. Maybe you need to let that congressman know that. So I think over the next 12 months, we're going to see a very interesting blending of using the technology to gain office, to mobilize people, to gain office, and using the technology to launch and maintain a political campaign by the sitting president used not only against the opposition party, but I suspect maybe even more so against the Democrats. And again, I, I want to close this by saying that I think that the state of California has an important role to play in this. I think that the Annenberg School for Communication has a tremendous role to play in this because the things that we are working on, that our colleagues are working on, on these networks and new media, are exactly the kinds of things that can help the United States of America and its current administration overcome the problems that they, that they confront. And not only overcome the problems, but seize the opportunities that lie before us. So I think this is going to be a, a good time for the Annenberg School for Communication uh, because I do think we have listeners in Washington who are concerned about these issues. Thanks for coming. Fascinating conversation, we do thank you for doing so much to chew on, and thank you all very much for coming.